Hi, today I'm going to be talking about our paper, A Near Cubic Lower Bound for Three Query Locally Decodable Codes from Semi Random CSP Orientation. I'm Peter, and this is joint work with Omar Al Rabia and Venkat Furuswami at UC Berkeley, as well as Pravesh Katari at Carnegie Mellon University. So I'd like to start off our talk by just defining locally decodable codes, which is the object that we study in our paper. So locally decodable code uh, is a code that takes as input a K bit message B and encodes it as an n-bit string x, such that the n-bit string is, well, locally decodable, as the name implies. What does this mean? Well, it means that formally there is a decoder that will take as input of index i and k, that's an index specifying which bit b sub i we are going to attempt to decode from x. The decoder then gets to toss some coins, and based on the output of these coins, query the string x in some number, some small number of spots. The decoder then reads the values of x on only these coordinates, and based on those values, outputs some estimate b hat sub i um, for, for b sub i. And we would like the decoder to be recovering b sub i. Formally, we say that a code c is a q delta epsilon locally decodable code if, when given access to any x tilde that is obtained from taking the true encoding x of the message b and flipping its bits in at most delta n coordinates, then the decoding algorithm, when given this input, needs to have the following properties. First, uh, the decoding algorithm on input i should be making at most q queries to x tilde. And secondly, regardless of the input i, the decoder should indeed be outputting b sub i, that is, it recovers the, the correct bit with probability a bit better than a half, say a half plus epsilon. And here you should treat delta and epsilon as constants. So locally decodable codes are a pretty natural object to study, and they're indeed very useful. They're used in the construction of PCPs, for example, in the proof of the PCP theorem. Uh, they're used in private information retrieval schemes, and they're also used in average case to worst case reductions in complexity theory and many more things. So locally decodable codes are very useful objects. And as is kind of the normal question you would ask in coding theory, the first question you ask for locally decodable codes is, well, what is the best possible rate? And here we need to parameterize by Q because of course the rate will change depending on how many queries we allow a locally decodable code to have. Of course, when Q is say N, then a locally decodable code is simply just a normal code. So we, we, we expect the rate to change with Q. And so let me just put a table here explaining uh, the current known results for Q where we upper and have upper and lower bounds on, on the rate. So first off for Q equals one, this is not really a, I guess it's like kind of a trivial value for Q, right? A one query locally decodable code doesn't really make much sense. So the first non-trivial value for Q is Q equals two. And here the construction of the Hadamard code achieves a block length N that's two to the K, it's exponential in the number of bits in the message K. And you might think this is pretty bad, except for the fact that there is in fact a matching lower bound that we can prove showing that N does have to be exponential in K. So up to a constant factor in the exponent, we actually know what the, the correct value of N should be as a function of K, at least in the case where Q equals two. So now let's go, I guess, to Q equals three. And here, there's in fact an interesting upper bound. There's a construction called the matching vector codes due to Yakanin and Efremenko, which shows that there is in fact a three query locally decodable code that has block length N that's sub exponential in K. And notice that this is strictly below the lower bound where Q equals two. So this shows that actually the third query that we allow the code to use um, is actually allowing us to make some strict improvements over the case when Q equals two. On the other hand, the lower bounds, the lower bound is actually quite poor. We only know that N is at least K squared. So this polynomial versus this sub-exponential function is a pretty big gap. And this lower bound is due to Kerendis and de Wolf, which initially came with some additional polylog factors that then got shaved off in later work by David Woodruff. And we can furthermore ask what happens for any constant Q. And when Q is a constant and even, we know that N has to be at least K to the Q over Q minus two. Um, and when Q is odd, it's K to the Q plus one over Q minus one, where here you observe that, uh, well, when Q equals odd, we're simply applying the lower bound to Q equals even, observing that a Q query locally decodable code is simply a Q plus one query locally decodable code, where Q plus one is now even. And here I'm suppressing polylog factors in K, which I will do throughout the talk. Okay, so let's zoom a little bit in on the Q equals three case, because this is sort of the first non-trivial value of Q that we don't fully understand. 
the q equals three, we can just draw this picture where on the left, I have n equals k, which would be like the most efficient encoding possible. And on the right, I have n equals two to the k, which is a very, very inefficient encoding. And we know that the block length n has to be at least above k squared. And we know there is a construction where it's less than this sub-exponential function, which turns out to be two to the two to the root log k log log k. So yes, this is sub-exponential, but morally it feels closer to an exponential than something polynomial. And so the main result in our paper is that we prove a cubic lower bound. So we prove this k squared up to k cubed. And this is only a modest improvement. We might hope for something super polynomial as a lower bound. But nonetheless, this is a pretty, pretty substantial improvement because this problem has resisted uh, quite a bit of effort in even breaking this k squared barrier, as it stood for quite some time at this point. And you can view our k cubed lower bound as in fact, getting this trade-off of k to the q over q minus 2 for the value of q equals 3, which is odd. So we're achieving kind of this even q lower bound, but for an odd value of q. And that's what gets us our improvement. So that's our main result. We show that any three delta epsilon locally decodable code must have block length n. That's omega k cubed, where we suppress some polylog k factors and some polynomial dependence on delta and epsilon. And the interesting thing is how our proof works. We, in our proof, we, we leverage some pretty, pretty uh, fancy tools uh, developed in these prior works of Abascal Guruswami and Kotari and Guruswami and Kotari and myself, uh, which designed algorithms for semi-random CSP refutation. So we use these algorithms to prove our lower bound. And the conceptual takeaway here is coming from our work where we show that uh, QLDC lower bounds are somewhat equivalent to refuting a uh, specific type of QXOR instance. And so the main contribution of our paper is really this conceptual takeaway. Uh, we're just, and then we make some minor, I guess, improvements to the techniques of, of these prior works on CSP refutation. And so the cool thing about our proof is unlike prior work, our proof is not a reduction to a two query locally decodable code. We instead reduce to this XOR problem and refute the XOR instance. And this connection to CSP suggests perhaps new approaches to proving LDC lower bounds that might allow us to go beyond uh, k cubed or even beyond polynomial or get super polynomial lower bounds. So before I can dive in and explain this connection between QLDC lower bounds and XOR refutation, I first have to explain sort of the starting point of all LDC lower bounds. Whereas if you recall this picture for locally decodable codes, well, what's going on here? We have this decoder, and when it tosses these coins to determine which elements to query, well, the query sets can really be arbitrary. We don't have any control over what the decoder is doing. And moreover, even if we kind of knew that these query sets had a lot of structure, well, we don't know how the decoder is producing this estimate b hat sub i. So this decoder can really be arbitrary. So it's natural to want to kind of massage this generic LDC into an LDC that has a lot of structure because then we can kind of put the LDC in so, a so-called normal form that will make it a lot easier to analyze. And so this is done in prior work where it shows that without loss of generality, we can essentially assume that the following holds. Uh, there's, there's some asterisks that's really, really not important, uh, for, especially for the purposes of this talk. But, but yeah, so there's some, some slight caveats that, that don't really matter. But essentially without loss of generality, you can assume that there are Q-uniform hypergraphs, H1 through HK, where Q uniform hypergraph is simply a collection of subsets of size Q of, of this N, the number of bits in the encoding, where you have one hypergraph for each bit B sub I. You should think of this hypergraph as specifying for, for uh, the decoder when I'm trying to decode the ith bit. Uh, these are the sets that the decoder will query. And we want these, these sets to have some structure. So we can assume that these the, the, the hypergraphs are actually matching. Matchings, that is, um, the, the hyper edges within each H sub i are actually disjoint. Okay, and moreover, the H sub i's have size a linear number of hyper edges, linear in n. So, of course, you can only have at most, say, like n over q hyper edges um, that are a matching. So, this is essentially saying that the matching is, is some constant fraction away from a, a perfect matching. Okay, so this shows that the query sets have to have some structure. And we can also assume that decoder has a lot of structure as well. So the decoder will work by picking the C uniformly at random from H sub I 
and it will simply output the parity of the bits on, on this hyper edge. So that's how it decodes. The decoding function is no longer arbitrary. It's simply this, this XOR function. And so up here, I've color coded um, the, the encoded bits where each color corresponds to a different hyper edge in a specific hypergraph H sub I. So you can see the decoder has queried all three green bits. It could have, for example, if the coins had been different, queried all three red bits, but it queried all three green bits. And now it'll read uh, the three green bits and XOR them out and recover B hat of I that is zero. So that's the estimate. So essentially this, this is a generic reduction that allows us to put a lot of structure on the locally decodable code. Okay, so that's the starting point for the lower bound. And now I want to construct some XOR instances related uh, to these hypergraphs. So what do we do? It's pretty natural. We introduce variables, X sub J, one for each um, bit of the encoding. And we have, sorry, the XOR instances should depend on the message B that we are encoding. So we'll have a family of instances. So we have these variables, one for each bit of the encoding. And we have an equation, which is for each bit b sub i, and for each hyper edge c in h sub i, we want the sum of the bits in c, the hyper edge c, to be equal to b sub i. And what this is saying is that the decoder, when it queries c, we want it to be recovering the bit b sub i correctly. And of course, this is, you, you could have assignments x sub j that, that, that have high value, and they might not be related to the encoding of b, but we know that there is at least one good assignment to this instance, which is this the true encoding of b, because the true encoding of b uh, should be recovering each bit i and k with probability at least half plus epsilon, so therefore on average over i and k should recover um, the bit b sub i with probably at least half plus epsilon, and therefore it'll satisfy at least half plus epsilon fraction of these constraints. And so in particular, the value of the instance, which is the maximum fraction of satisfiable constraints, must be at least half plus epsilon, regardless of the in initial message B that was chosen. It could be larger, but, but we know it at least has some non-trivial value above a half. Okay, so now if we could show that for some choice of B, the value actually had to be smaller than half plus epsilon, we would have our desired lower bound because we would have shown that this, this, this code, the decoder cannot, cannot function. It cannot succeed with probably half plus epsilon uh, for any message B. And in particular, it suffices to argue that if I choose a random B, then with high probability, the value will be less than half plus epsilon, because in particular, then there exists such a B. And if we can show this, say, when N is like less than K to the Q over Q over Q minus two, then we have recovered our, our desired lower bound, because we know if N is less than K to the Q over Q minus two, then these instances cannot be satisfiable. And therefore, this these hypergraphs cannot correspond to a valid LDC. Okay, so how do we show unsatisfiability of this XOR instance? There are many ways to, to argue unsatisfiability in general, and you might try to do something very simple, like say the probabilistic method. Remember the size sub B has K bits of randomness coming from the message B. But the thing is, K is probably less than N, right? So you only, um, you only have less than, you have sublinear number of bits of randomness, but you're trying to union bound, if you use the probabilistic method, you're trying to union bound over all two to the N assignments uh, X. So you don't have enough bits of randomness really to do this, so this is not going to work. So one way to get around this is to use a refutation algorithm. Again, there are many ways to argue unsatisfiability of an X or instance, but refutation algorithms are, are one, one such way. So what is a refutation algorithm? It's simply an algorithm A takes as input an instance psi and outputs some, some, some uh, value in 0, 1. And it has the following guarantee which is that the output of the algorithm is an upper bound on the true value of the instance, regardless of what the input is. And this, and this, because of this, if uh, the algorithm outputs something that's less than half plus epsilon, then we know that the true value of the instance is also less than half plus epsilon. And so then we'll say that the algorithm A has succeeded in refuting the instance sum. Good. So. I mean, if we're looking for efficient algorithms, we probably shouldn't hope that our algorithm A will refute all instances. But we can ask what types of instances can we refute? And hopefully these LDC XOR instances will be a class of instances that we actually can refute, and then we'll be able to get lower bounds. And figuring out what types of instances we can refute uh, with an efficient algorithm is kind of the main question in CSP refutation. Okay, so 
if you're trying to figure out what types of instances you can refute, might be a good first step to try out, say, random instances. So you can generate a random psi with m constraints in the following way. You just pick a random q uniform hypergraph h, and then you choose random right-hand sides, b sub c, these are bits, for each constraint in the hypergraph. And then your equations in the instance are simply sum over j and c, x sub j should be equal to b sub c. Good. And so there's this work of Raghavendra Rao Ashram from 2017 that is a culmination of a pretty long line of work, but this gets the best state of the art, which shows that in n to the order all time, you can't succeed in refuting these instances, provided the number of constraints is at least n over l to the q over 2 minus 1 times n, where q is, is this q uniform, it's the arity of the hypergraph. And in the polynomial time case, when you set L to be a constant, this just says that M has to be at least N to the Q over two. And there's also in fact, a, a matching lower bound showing that degree order L sum of squares cannot be, the, needs, needs at least this many constraints in order to refute. And there's also this interesting work of Feige, Kim and Ofek, which shows that for three sat, uh, there exists these, these refutations that are short and efficiently verifiable when you have only n to the 1.4 constraints, which is a below the n to the 1.5 constraints you would need uh, in order to refute with a polynomial time algorithm. So this FKO certificates are like, if you allow the, the refutation algorithm to run in non-deterministic polynomial time. And here, uh, as I said earlier, I've suppressed a lot of polylog n factors, which I'm doing throughout the talk. Okay, so let's return back to this XOR instance, psi sub b, that we're trying to refute. Well, if we look at it, we'll notice that this hypergraph uh, H, which is the union of these H sub i's, is not really that random. It's pretty easy to construct hypergraph matchings, H1 through HK, such that the union does not look at all like a random hypergraph. And the thing is, these, these algorithms for refuting random instances are fairly brittle. Even if you deviate a little bit from this random model, you can break generally break these algorithms because they're based on uh, extracting spectral certificates from matrices, and you can kind of mess up the eigenvalues of the matrix pretty easily. And so this instance size of B is, is just really not very random. And so these algorithms are not, not strong enough to really refute these types of instances. Okay, but well you could ask, maybe we can refute more instances than just purely random ones. And so this is, um, this is called, so we're gonna be able to refute semi-random instances, as we'll see. And these are instances which are generated as follows. So we take this two-step process and we're just gonna simply replace the first step with a worst case hypergraph. So the second step remains unchanged. These right-hand sides are again, uniformly are chosen uniformly at random, but the, the hypergraph H is no longer random, it's arbitrary. And you can ask, well, what can you do here? Are these instances harder to refute than random? You might think they're harder to refute than fully random instances. I mean, a worst case hypergraph feels harder, but it turns out that this is not the case, um, a work of, Venkat, Pravesh, and myself show that, in fact, you can refute these instances in essentially the same amount of time and at the same number with the same number of constraints as you needed to refute random instances. So they're no harder to refute than random ones. And again, this lower bound of Kotari, Mori, O'Donnell, and Wittmer still applies. And we also show that those FKO certificates that existed for random three set also exist even in the case of semi-random or even smooth three set. So if we return to this instance size sub b, we'll notice that it's kind of almost semi-random. What's the difference? Well, we, I mean, we still have an arbitrary hypergraph, that's fine, but we don't have a random bit b sub c uh, for each constraint. We only have one bit b sub i for each hypergraph. And the thing is here, we've, we've kind of, we, we only have, we have k bits, so we have fewer bits, but on the other hand, these hypergraphs h sub i are actually structured. So we have one bit for, for these hypergraphs h sub i, but those are matchings. So we've traded off a bit. We've got less randomness, but we've got some more structure in the hypergraph. So the instance is almost semi-random, and there's this, this interesting trade-off going on. And it's maybe reasonable to expect some of the, the algorithms here that are more robust to this worst case hypergraph um, the semi-random CSP refutation algorithms to be able to even refute such instances, these psi sub b's, these LDCX ones. And indeed, this is what we show. This is kind of the main thing we prove in our paper. We hit this problem with the semi-random CSP refutation techniques, and we're able to show that in fact, if the, the block length n is less than k cubed, then this algorithm in our prior work succeeds in refuting the instance size of b with high probability over b in n to the order root n over k time. 
So it's not an efficient refutation algorithm by any means, but this doesn't matter. We just need to argue that these instances are unsatisfiable. So the runtime doesn't matter. And just if we combine this with kind of the stuff I've said earlier about showing how this, this is equivalent to an LDC lower bound, then we indeed get our desired lower bound, which says that n has to be at least k cubed. And that's our main result. So the important thing here is the proof, though, is not a reduction to a 2LDC. It goes through this connection to XOR instances that I explained before. And indeed, the, the algorithm here that we'll be using to refute will do transformations to this, this XOR instance that are very, very not LDC-like, and they're only natural in the context of, of X, viewing the instance really as an XOR instance and not viewing it as an LDC. And so this connection with CSP, CSPs is really giving us a new approach here. And perhaps this will, will lead to improved lower bounds even beyond k cubed or for a larger cube. So that's my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. You can find the paper online. Thank you.